Your salvation is a legal issue. It's not a feeling issue. I've told you that many times, a legal issue. And you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. You have legal rights. You need to know those rights. Satan is trying all he can to keep that hidden from you so that you, you don't know what your rights are and he can continue to kill, steal, and destroy and steal everything God has given you and what he wants to do in your life. But you must know how to stop him. It's interesting. How many have heard of Lester Summerall? Yeah, he's in heaven now, but we grew up hearing him preach, uh, knew him in, in a sense, not in a great close way, but knew him and heard him preach many, many times. He tells of the time when he was in Central America and he cast a demon out of a witch doctor. Laying his hands upon that witch doctor, he said to come out. Witch doctor flopped over in the ground stood back up praying in tongues and born again. But later that night, Lester tells the story. He went to bed that night and it was a hot night. He opened the window of his hut there in Central America, no air conditioning back then. The room began to fill with a horrible smell. It got cold in the room. All of a sudden, and I'm going to quote now, I'm going to read, suddenly, the heat of the night disappeared from the room. A damp chill filled the place. It was so cold, Dr. Summerall began to shiver. A wind began to blow the curtains wildly on their rods. Then the bed began to shake so violently that it moved all the way out into the middle of the floor. Well, Dr. Summerall had enough of this. He raised up on his bed and said, You demon spirit, I recognize you. I cast you out earlier today. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Get out. Immediately, the evil presence left the room. The heat returned. The curtains laid down against the wall. The bed stopped shaking. The odor left the room. But that wasn't what happened next. Instead, he thought a moment and then sat back up in the bed, looked out the window and shouted, Hey, devil, get back in here. <laughs> the curtains began to shake. The wind rushed in. The coldness returned, the smell returned, the bed began to shake violently and almost shook him out of the bed. Dr. Summerall said, devil, when I came into this room, my bed was up against that wall. Now in the name of Jesus, put it back. <laughs> the, began, the, bed, the bed began to shake and shook clear across the room till it sat exactly where it was when he walked in the room. Today, you know, most Christians think it's a great victory if they stop the devil. It's a great victory if we stop, and then they, you know, stop. But they need to take it one step further and realize where that bed's supposed to be at, what that life's supposed to look like, what the devil tried to steal from you. And you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing to say, you know, come out, but hey, what were you taking? Put it back, Right? We need to know how to handle the devil and think differently about this situation. Luke chapter 13 gives us an example. You've read this before. Verse 10, Jesus on a Sabbath day teaching. A woman is there had been crippled by the spirit, a spirit for 18 years. 18 years. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. He put his hands on her and she was immediately healed. The uh, synagogue leaders were indignant because he did that on the Sabbath day. And Jesus said, you hypocrites. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall, lead it out and give it water? That should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day? See, it was a legal issue. She was already legally uh, a daughter of Abraham. She already had the legal right to be healed. Jesus said, why shouldn't she be healed? She's a daughter of Abraham. It's legal. Everyone say, it's legal. It's legal. It's legal, it's legal for her to be healed. It's a legal issue. Now, how did Satan keep her bound for 18 years then? No one knew the law. The Pharisees, religion, had convinced her probably that it was God's will until Jesus showed up. Praise God. 
and said, come out, you know, come out of here. And she was instantly healed. This was a legal case. Yours is a legal case as well. Psalms 103.2 says this, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Read the instructions, friend. Remember what the instructions say. Remember the benefits, right? What does the Bible say? How many promises are there? They're very clear. They're already yours. Forget not the benefits. He heals all your diseases, forgives all your sins, right? It's amazing. He redeems your life from the pit. He brought you out from under Satan's jurisdiction. Understand where you stand legally. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. You have his name, his authority, and his assignment, his anointing. You don't have to sit there and take it. You need to know who you are. And those who know you need to know that you know who you are because they need to understand that you can help them as well receive freedom, right? So stop the chaos. I tell this story back way back when I was just beginning to learn how the kingdom operated. My van burned up. I won't tell the story, but it burned up. The insurance agent calls and said, Mr. Cassie, yeah, it's totaled, and here's the check we're going to give you. I had just happened to be viewing the policy that day, and I noticed that if it burned by fire, there was no deductible. But the agent said, well, after the deductible, we'll give you a check for this amount. I said, uh, excuse me? On page 8, subparagraph E, section 5, sentence 6, word 3, you know, <laughs> it says... That if this thing burns by fire, you pay me the entire amount, no deductible. Are you expecting the insurance company to point that out? Are you expecting the devil to point it out? No, friend, you have to know your legal rights. You have to know what to say in that situation. For what you say in that situation determines your future and the bill you're going to pay. Mm hmm You see, stopping the devil is only part of the equation. But so many Christians, that's what they get excited about, stopping the devil, stopping the devil. Well, there's a whole lot more than stopping the devil because he's trying to keep something from you. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says in verse 19, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. That's the authority of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth, heaven backs up. Whatever you loose on earth, heaven backs up. Now, we've talked about binding the devil, stopping him from stealing, killing, and destroying. But how do we lose heaven? Now, this is where I found that a lot of the church doesn't know how to step into that. We can go, Jesus, 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 you know. We can have a little success there. But unless we know what it's supposed to look like, we won't tell the devil to put it back. We'll just lick our wounds and say, well, we stopped him, but he's still ran off with some stuff you're supposed to have. So how do you lose heaven? How do we bring heaven into the earth realm? Of course, faith is required. I don't have time to teach faith. Faith is required to make it legal for heaven to invade earth. As you know, and you learned my, study, my, my teaching, the kingdom of God gave the man, uh, the, the earth realm, gave it to Adam to rule over. People have the jurisdiction in the earth realm. God has to work through people who have the legal jurisdiction here. And so Satan's always trying to pervert God's character and to hide the truth of who you are in Christ, the authority that you have in, in this realm. First off, who holds the keys to do that? Say it again. You do. You have the keys. If you don't turn the key, the key's not going, right? The car's not going anywhere. Even though you own the keys, have the title, you're not going anywhere unless you learn how to drive the Corvette. You can't drive the Corvette till you start. You've got to have the keys. So many believers don't have a clue where the key's at, or there even is a key, as I say in my teaching, the switch. They don't know how to turn the lights on. They don't know there is a switch, never knew there was a switch, have no clue where it's at, how to turn it on. And when it doesn't show up, they, they blame God for it. But I guess it must be God's will that, you know, so-and-so died. I believe I, it must have been God. I mean, he has the power. Well, the power company has the power. But unless you turn the switch on, the lights aren't coming on. That's in your jurisdiction. But you know what? You had to learn about a switch. Babies aren't born with the knowledge that there's a switch that turns lights on. You had to learn about lights. 
And you already know that lights can be duplicated anywhere in the world that anyone follows the laws that govern lights. It's not a choice of if they're good or bad or anything. like. It's a, it's a law. You understand how to put those wires together and create the electricity, and you, have the, you turn the switch on and the bulb works, you'll have light. Anywhere, 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 for anyone. And the kingdom works exactly the same way. Get out of this mindset that you have to feel the anointing. You have to feel that you're saved. you got to forget it. This is a legal issue, friend. It's law. And you must know how to stand on the law and how to speak the law and tell the devil to shut up and loose what heaven says about your life. Because unless you do, nothing's going to change. But now, most Christians kind of filter what they say through their perception of what they have. What they see happening, you know, what their bank account says in it, what their body says. They filter, you know, they're not, they don't, they, they feel uncomfortable speaking what heaven says unless they see it. And this is backwards. Tonight, I need you to understand what and how this works. So in Galatians chapter 4 is the best example of how this works. And we need to spend just a little bit of time here. So verse 21, chapter 4, it says, tell me. You who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. Which one sounds best so far? Free, right. His son by the slave woman was born in what kind of way? Ordinary way. The ordinary way. But his son by the free woman was born as a result of a... Now this is absolutely essential that you understand this. It was totally impossible for Sarah to have kids. So you need to explain to me how Isaac got here. If you can't explain how Isaac got here, your Isaac, whatever promise you're trying to get in your life is not going to show up either. I tell you to be a spiritual scientist, I always say if you can't teach it, you can't live it. You need to be able to explain how did Isaac get here. And you know what people say? Well, God did it. No, but he went through a man. It wasn't legal in the earth realm for that to happen unless a man opened the door to heaven to do it. So tell me how he did it. Tell me how you can do it. You must know these answers. So how was Isaac conceived if it was impossible? By a, it says, by a promise. Not just a promise that you can mentally uh, agree with, We'll find out a promise that Abraham actually believed. The ordinary way or the free way. Now dropping down to 28. Now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise. At that time the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the what? Power of the spirit. You have a choice. The ordinary way is nine months. Has labor attached to it. Delivery attached to it. Or you have now a system of born by the power of the Spirit. And it's pretty amazing. What does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the what? Underline that word. Underline that word. Look at verse 27. Be glad, O barren woman who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud. You have no labor pains because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband or the ordinary way. How much labor do you have to put into receiving an inheritance? How much? Zero. Zero. Whose will is it? Whose who's purpose that you receive that inheritance, the receiver or the one giving it? All you have to do is, is accept it. A few legal things you've got to sign off on, but it's already, it's already yours. Is that right? How much of it? You're, it's all yours. Now notice the Bible says there's the ordinary way, the slave way, the, the earth realm way, the labor way, doing it your way, the hard way, and there's the inheritance way, the free way. Received by a promise. <laughs> Which one sounds better? You think God has more than you have? And he says he's going to give you inheritance of the entire kingdom. Would you like that? Everything in the kingdom, all the kingdom. You know the Bible says you're a co-heir with Christ. Did you know that everything Jesus has is yours as well? Do you know the Bible says he's your brother? 
You belong to the same family, the same inheritance. So the Bible says, Ephesians 2.19 says, you are a citizen of this kingdom and a member of the family. A member of the family has the inheritance. A citizen has the legal rights of the kingdom, the citizenship. You need to know how that affects your life in both ways. All right, so Isaac has been born by a promise and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So how much work was involved for Sarah and Abraham to do to make that happen in that sense? There's no labor. I mean, they had to receive it. Remember, it was impossible to have kids. It was impossible. They had to receive that promise. How do you think your future is going to be birthed in your life? Did you know that every single thing you receive from God must be birthed in your spirit first? Meaning the picture of it has to come and that you believe it's yours. So what does a promise do? A promise carries with it a what? A picture. If I said, I promise you $1,000 tonight, I'm going to give you a $100 bill, you would picture it, you would imagine, because you trust me, you would imagine that you have that, you'd get it, right? And you can see it. You know what a $100 bill looks like. You can see it. Or if I said, I'm going to give you a green Volkswagen Beetle, you would see a green, you know, you can see it, all right? So the, a promise carries a picture with it. Now, the picture you currently have in your spirit is holding you in a certain place. If you see yourself broke or sick, that's, that's where you're at. So how do we change that picture on the inside of us? How does it happen every payday? Someone gives you a, a check, right? That's a promissory note. So the picture changes on the inside when someone you trust gives you a promise of, of something they wanna give you, is that right? So it, it carries with it a picture. So Isaac was received by the power of a promise, a picture that Abraham carried, that God said he'd be, he would have heirs, that he'd have a son, and Abraham believed that it was possible because God said it. He carried that picture on the inside, incubating it. Now, the word of God is compared many times in the Bible as a seed. So heaven is going to release the word into the earth realm, into the hearts of people where it incubates and produces faith. When their spirit comes into agreement with what heaven says, that's called faith. Remember the one example in Mark chapter 4, it says the seed's the smallest, one of the smallest, if not the smallest seed planted in the garden. But after a while it grows and becomes the largest, which shades the entire garden, which means you once couldn't see the seed, but now all you see is the tree. You close your eyes, all you can see is that tree. You know, it's one of the, it's the smallest. You see all the weeds. You see all the problem. You see the grass and the garden. Nothing in the garden worth whatever, you know, it's, it's a worthless garden. You plant this seed. You come back. And eventually that seed, if you keep it there, all by itself it grows and it becomes the largest thing visible so much that it produces rest for the birds and there's peace there. So here's a test. If you're in faith, close your eyes. What do you see? Close your eyes. What do you see? If you cannot see what the promise says, you're not in faith yet. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, picture, and the evidence of things not seen. 